Hey folks, Vete here. Just jumping in here before the episode to let you know that you can contact us via email at inonesken at gmail.com. All one word, no apostrophes, I-N-O-N-E-S-K-E-N at gmail.com. Also, you can find us on social media. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Just search for In One's Ken. So if you want to reach out to us, leave us feedback, have a question, or even make a show suggestion, you can find us and we would love to hear from you. Remember, you can find our show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio, and for our US and Canadian listeners, on Google Play Music. And lastly, you can also find us on YouTube. Plenty of ways to find us and listen to our show, folks. Speaking of shows, on with this one. Dear kindly Sergeant Krupke, you gotta understand, it's just our bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunks. Golly Moses, naturally we're punks. Gee, Officer Krupke, we're very upset. We never had the love that every child ought to get. We ain't no delinquents, we're misunderstood. Deep down inside us, there is good. There is good. There is good. There is good. There is untapped good. Like inside, the worst of us is good. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 210, as Eat has told me, of In One's Kin. I'm James, joined by Robert. Are you sure about that? It's a good question. We can't get into this. No one will understand. Is that the point? <laughs> Envy. Hello, hello. We back at it again at the Krispy Kreme. No one else will get that either. Look it up. <laughs> Anyways, how's it going, guys? Uh, good, Mike. Good. I can't even. I can't even. Yeah. So, like a majestic crane dodging the propeller of a wind turbine, I'm going to avoid talking about current events. Oh, man. Because <laughs> that will become the entire episode. It would. It would. Let, I, I will simply say this. It's pretty much what I expected. I can't wait at the end of all of this. I can't wait to see the movie. I'm, I'm just... I, I I think the worst part about all this for me is I'm just not surprised. I'm not. I'm just not. And let's just leave it at that and move on. Otherwise, I will rip everyone a new a-hole. Let's just go, please. Oh, man. Beat, how you been? How you been, been Beat? Uh, uh, good, guys, good. What have I been up to? Um, final update on my... Um, promotion that I applied for. Uh, I didn't get it. I was unsuccessful. I finally got a phone call four days after we last talked about this at our last recording. So uh, almost four weeks after I had interviewed, I finally got a phone call at home from my boss who was calling from home, not even from work, to say I was unsuccessful. The person I expected to get the job got the job. Uh, my reasons for not getting the job were correct because she did say she wanted to catch up with me in person, which we did a few days later. Uh, I basically was unsuccessful because I have no postgraduate qualifications, which I knew would sort of play against me. Uh, not that the person who did get it has much of a postgraduate qualification, but it's still more than me. Uh, secondly, the doctors don't know who I am and for a nursing position, the doctors have, um, quite a influential say on that position, which I find completely wrong to put it simply. Um, I, it's fine to ask them of their opinion because the charge nurse does have to work quite closely with the doctors, but for them to have such an influential sway on that decision, I am almost appalled. And thirdly, I haven't done enough for the unit. And by that, I mean not the work I do on a day-to-day basis, but rather I don't do the extra projects on the side that 
helps get the unit's face more recognized, more seen. You know, it's sort of all the political things, I guess, I haven't done. So we did set up a bit of a plan as to how to go forward from here. Um, I will say she, she, I think she was quite impressed by what I do for the unit and what I how much how much I actually care about the place where I work um, but it was quite obvious that there's this there's this door in our unit and one side of the door is the actual hospital part right it's the the beds the patients the nurses the, the people who do the day-to-day -day work and on the other side of the door is all admin and there's quite a that door creates quite a divide and there's sort of little little that goes backwards and forwards in my opinion as to what one what people do on either side of the door so i think she was sort of in this process of the interview had found out um just what I do contribute to the unit. So it was a very interesting process. I'm just glad it's bloody over. I tell you, the stress of not knowing, the stress of getting my hopes up and having that bubble burst is, um, yes, I'm glad it's just all over. So that's that's that saga over and done with. Just quickly here, it's uh, my daughter Samantha's ball day today, her, her prom um, so if you hear a bunch of clattering and voices in the background, there's hair and makeup and God knows whatever else is going on. And I'm safely tucked up in this corner of the house recording this podcast, sort of trying to stay away as much as possible. As and lastly, bobbity boo blares ugh. in the background. Um, I'll just, I'm happy to stay oblivious to it all. And lastly, and I forgot to mention this way back when I did the whole Samurai Jack episode and i mentioned that i started watching the final fifth season and I, at that point i was four episodes in and now i've i have completed the the 10 episodes and i just want to say how grateful i am that uh gendy Tart tartakovsky there we go I stumbled on the last name um managed to do this complete the series give me a end um just it was just great. It was everything I wanted and more. Um, it was so clever. Um, it was m like more of the same, but different. Uh, and I was just like, it, I will say I was a little sad and did bring a little tear to my eye when that the final set of credits came through and Jack had achieved what he always wanted to achieve. And it, it was just, just wonderful. And I just wanted to mention it here before I forget. Samurai Jack, it's just, I can't get enough. So that's that's been my time, mate. Awesome. Yeah. Robert, what you been up to? Oh, boy. Um, other than watching just stuff happen, um, I, <laughs> goodness, um, I watched a little bit of E3, was... As per the usual at this point, just disappointed. I was going to say disappointed, but I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, um, apparently, we learned that Destiny-type games are now a thing that need to be made. By Bioware? By Bioware. <laughs> what? And then they, they introduced the video game in the same exact beat-for-beat beat almost. Bioware, yeah, is making this open world game with a bunch of guns and stuff in it. And I'm just, <sighs> it's better mass effect. No, I'm, I'm actually really against this whole thing where, and maybe it's just me being old. I don't understand. I don't know, but I'm actually against this entire like genre that they're trying to force where it's just massive open space and the entire, higher purpose of the open space is for you to just hang out with your friends in it mindlessly it they man shooter looter like b yeah. borderlands borderlands has ruined shooters borderlands is an amazing game but then bungie was like hey let's take that to the next level and do like like this whole mmo thing under that idea and now it's just it's gone off the rails to the point that 
the reveal of what what was it even called? Anthem. Anthem. They they even picked up an Ingram. They they literally killed an enemy and picked up an Ingram from Destiny and then identified into a legendary. Well, and there was also there was also like the whole way that they presented it, where it's like there there's no drama to it. There's nothing there's nothing fantastic. It's just the character walks down to the platform and then another player just lands beside them and they go, Oh hey, you got a mortar attached to your gear. Yeah, I picked it up over the weekend. And then they just they just leap off into their adventure. I'm just like, Oh my god. Yep. It's uh it, Oh my god. It's it's all of that kind of hollow uh gamified meta of of a Diablo game. It's it's just like, hey, let's, hey man, what's up? Oh, I see you got a new legendary. Yeah, man, let me try it out. Let's go, let's go kill this boss. Awesome, man. Yeah, it's and just, you know, I don't. It's I don't mean this popcorn. Yeah, and I don't. I don't mean to sound like disparaging. I just because it's not. It's not directed towards people that enjoy those games. Because I I I played Destiny for quite a while. I actually did enjoy it. I still um, played. Th- uh, Diablo from time to time, yeah, because and, of that and, and, just yeah. mindlessness of it. Yeah, it's fun. Um, I don't want my games to become this, and they're all becoming this. It, it, it's every game is turning into these open sandbox, plotless drop in, drop crap. Out. Yeah, just uh, and I want I want something with more substance to it. I want more meat on these bones. I don't I don't want you to craft an environment and then just say <laughs> go have fun in there kids well, I don't, they're I don't doubling down it. they're doubling yeah. down on the biggest problem we had with destiny flair without substance and they're like all right just double up on the flair like why are we doing this why are we going to do this it doesn't matter just give them cool weapons yeah and that's why like i have no faith in destiny too even the fact that there's already a destiny 2 is a red flag for me um yeah, so those those things are are upsetting. Um, on the other hand, we actually are finally getting a trailer for Kingdom Hearts three. So, yay! A game that will never come out. You shut your dirty mouth. It's only slightly further along in production than Half Life three. <laughs> uh, apparently, they're they're promising that at uh, next month's D twenty three. Expo. That's Disney's convention for anybody not in the know. Uh, there will actually be a genuine trailer and possibly even a release date. Dude, Shocking. Okay, look, look, look. We will get the Kingdom Hearts 360 XD Wasabi Edition remix before we will get Kingdom Hearts 3. <laughs> Probably. Probably. Maybe. I don't know. It, it's It's just, yeah. I don't know what to think about gaming much anymore. Like I, I enjoy it immensely, but every time I'm like, "Hmm, what do?" I just keep going back to Fallout Four. And so, soon Fallout VR, and that's when Robert will die in a chair, <laughs> his eyes covered, never seeing the light of day again. No, I'll just have the Mountain Dew intravenously shot into my arm. It'll be the only way to move forward at that point. Just work out a deal with Taco Bell to get Baja Blast infinite, yeah. just infinite Baja Blast. Exactly. Just go for it. Give no Fs. Um, yeah. And then the other thing that happened, um, which I think all three of us kind of want to talk about a little bit, um, Wonder Woman doesn't suck. No. no. For the most part. I think it's completely overrated, but it's not bad. It's actually a good film. I was totally with it. Like, was legit on board was having fun and then the last like 30 minutes of the movie is just a Zack Snyder CG nightmare like, I, don't, I, don't, I was just I like don't, I don't mind bad. I do yes, not mind the CG nightmare okay I don't mind that at all the only thing that bothered me was the is like you and I were talking about earlier the entire reveal where it's like the bad guy shows up and he's like I'm gonna show up now because the movie needs to end and it's like mm. time to finish this he says to the audience <laughs> yeah and I'm, I'm just like you have no reason to be here and, and then it's like oh man he's expositing wait a minute even in the past, thousands of years ago, in Greek society, he was still a British man with a mustache. Apparently. <laughs> hey, Remus Lupin gets around, all right? Hey, he does. He does. <laughs> what the heck, man? Uh, yeah, that was, that was terribly miscast. No, I mean, I liked it. I mean, like, I genuinely liked it. 
I've seen it twice. I want to go again. Um, I I really enjoyed the film. I just I it's everything else around it that is just kind of like got me scratching my head. Now, mind you, as I'm about to say this, this in no way takes away from the quality of the movie. All right, the movie is no. fantastic. Go yes. see it. Ninety three percent Rotten Tomatoes, greatest thing that's ever happened. Pale be praised. Directed mm. by women. Who cares? I mean, I, I just, there's all of this hype around the movie that is non-existent to the movie. It's, it's like quietly implied that if it was directed by anyone else, it would be a bad movie. Yes. And, and that, <laughs> it's like, and, that's scary guys. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I'm like I said, I actually think it's a good film. I really enjoy I do it. Too. I bought I, the soundtrack. I just, you know, I'm, I, I just, I, I see everyone else out there. And this is part of a, like a greater meta discussion. We don't have time for where it's like, there's this cultural bent where they're like, Oh, well it's the highest grossing film directed by a woman. This means that you have to like it. And it's like, why can't I just like the movie on its own merit? <laughs> because I do. But then you're, but you're, you're tell you're, you're basically telling me that if I go, if I don't like this movie, then I'm somehow a sexist. And it's and I Ghostbusters I, round two, pretty much. And and there's a there's an interesting aspect to that, which is um, like there was a there was a there was a podcast uh, that I that I watch. They do a video podcast, and they spent like an entire week saying we're gonna review Wonder Woman, we're gonna review Wonder Woman, and then the day came, and then they were like, yeah, we walked out about two thirds of the way in. And, what? Months. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, wow, wow. Only here's the thing, here's the thing. He cared about his points a lot more than I do, because he walked out. He also walked out on Spectre, which I agree was a boring ass James Bond film. Um, but he, he, all of his points were things that I couldn't argue with, like the late villain reveal, the the like two minutes of expository near the end of the film to suddenly make it justified. The fact that the villains are completely forgettable and uninteresting um you know just like the fact you know, like the very beginning of the first fight like the amazon surrender the high ground you know when they charge the beach you know there's, there's just like the little things throughout that i was just like i couldn't argue with any of his points not a one i don't think any of those points were worth walking out of the movie over no, no. <laughs> absolutely not no. you could uh, just be like well that you know, I couldn't suspend my belief, but it's a movie. Jesus Christ. It's not like the prophet coming down from heaven. And you'd be like, oh, you forgot a comma on that commandment. It completely changes everything. I'm walking away from this religion. Yeah, yeah. And and I think I think a lot of it, too, because like one of the things that he mentioned that I found interesting um, was he said before he went to go see it, he was checking out, you know, a Rotten Tomatoes and they were all like 94 percent and all that stuff. That's the Dark Knight. Right. That's Heath Ledger's Joker level. This movie is not that. No, it's not. It's yeah. fun. Yeah, but it's really good. It's really good, but it's not that level. So, you know, I can totally see going into the film with this expectation that it's going to be, you know, this good. And then it's just it's just pretty middle road. Yeah. It, here's the one thing this movie does prove. Ghostbusters may actually be a bad movie. <laughs> Part three. <laughs> It oh, retroactively man. proves that Ghostbusters 3 is a bad movie. Yeah, because we didn't not go see it because it was sexist of us. That was not the point. It was just bad. <laughs> and one, one, one little fast fact, a fact about Wonder Woman. The creator of Wonder Woman created the polygraph test. <laughs> there you go. Living in a house so, yeah. where I've got two quite strong feminists, and they won't mind me calling them feminists, who actually, absolutely adored the movie. I do see, I do see the movie. Oh, I can see the movie through their eyes and what they saw, which is different to what I saw, and I can appreciate why they do like it so much, particularly in the way they handle the side, the the sidekick or the the what was it, Broa Slane, as I have heard people refer to um, uh, the male lead, the male, Steve yeah, Trevor, the male lead. So, yeah. Uh, Steve, Steve Trevor is um, yeah. Steve Trevor's cool. Okay, yeah. that guy, no, that guy, that guy has been shafted in the comics for decades. Oh now. yeah, it's actually cool. it's actually great to see that in this movie he was done justice. But I do I, I do admit that I think because it was a female director that that person was handled differently 
and better for that for because of it uh, than if it was a male director. And I admit I'm generalizing here, but having listened to my wife explain um, how he was handled and how a male director could have possibly have handled him, um, I, I, do, I do appreciate why there's such an appeal to uh, females for this movie. Yeah, but I see just like the, the, the personal individual in me just goes that that's a sexist opinion. I don't I don't understand why the gender of the director matters. I mean, I could see Joss it Whedon does, directing because the, you, the same way. Because you no, Joss du- Whedon would have done this the same way. No, he wouldn't because no. like he would have not have sexualized them in the way that they're not sexualizing this film. I mean, you've got all these female characters that I like seeing running around, jumping around, kicking butt, and it's great. Yeah. And they're not done in a sexualized manner. I True. think that's fantastic. And yep. I've seen other directors who have done that as well. You know. All right. Here you go. Here's a feminist perspective. I actually disliked him being a character in it because he was used as an empowerment moment for her because she, all she needed was the, oh, not as bad as they could man. have done. Not as bad as uh, that has been she, done. She would have lost if she hadn't discovered love. No. Oh yeah, I've heard. I've heard people ripping no. that one left and right. I was like, "Are you?" Ki-? I was sitting there in the movie. I was like, "Are you kidding me?" The thing they didn't. <laughs> the thing they didn't do was have him save her at some point, which is what the majority of directors would have done. But he because did he was her. a male. He but would. I, he convinced her of love. And that's that's how you save a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being completely facetious here. I understand that. No, but I was, I was this is say, a train of thought you can take. No, that that's why that's why like I said, I don't I I actually don't look at the movie in those lenses because as soon as you do, you start going into well, he's mansplaining to her the entire film because she's wrong the entire movie. Yeah. She, she's wrong. She's, she's, she's on a ignorant. fantasy adventure for two hours before reality comes crashing down around her, which you already know from lines that she has in Batman vs Superman, right? I mean, it, I mean, it's like if you really want to go that route, it, it eventually just becomes a sexist discussion. Like, this and there's, is becoming there's no a one Wonder wins. Woman episode. No, I know, I know. I'm just we can move on. I'm just saying nobody wins once you start going down this route. It's just not. It's just not a pretty picture. I I just like the movie. I think the movie like on its it. own is great. I enjoyed it. Like I said, I've seen it twice. I want to go again. I bought the soundtrack. I really enjoy it. I, you know, I could talk about some more because I think it's a good movie. It's just there's all it's like with Ghostbusters, like we were talking about earlier. There's all this other stuff around it that everybody wants to make a big deal out of. I'm just kind of like, ugh. I agree. Wonder Woman was a good movie, and I I enjoyed her characterization. She was ignorant without being helpless. Yes, I like that too. No, I mean, like it was just—it was just true to the character. It was a good movie. A lot. Sorry, hang on. Let me let me re retract that word. Not ignorant, naive. That's the word I'm looking for. She was naive without being helpless. You know, I heard naive when you said it. Yeah, I I was like, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. See, ignorant is a very aggressive word nowadays. Like, but it's, it's supposed not to be bad to does be ignorant. not know with, without knowledge, but naive is a, a softer way to say without knowledge. It's about yeah. that experience. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's nothing. So, wrong with for being all the ignorant. people who quit right before I retracted this, <laughs> you missed out. I totally changed my verbiage and everything. We're SJW compliant. <laughs> SJW. What's this? Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you don't have a week, James. Threats incoming. Yeah, you don't have a week, James. <laughs> You're just like, whatever, move on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, stuff and junk. Um, been playing Final Fantasy fourteen again because the new expansion came out this morning that I stayed up all night for because I couldn't sleep. It's cool. And we can be samurais now. I'm enjoying it. I mean, it's it's exactly what you would expect from World of Warcraft, except slower. The mm-hmm. combat's slower. <laughs> <laughs> um, been reading. Um. Neil Gaiman's uh, Norse mythology. He like did his own take on Norse mythology, and you would think it would be like a textbook. It's not. It's it's straight up a fictional narrative. Like it's a, it tells a story. That's how you learn about everything. It's really good. And I started reading uh, Thor, the God of Thunder, God Butcher, because that arc finished, and I'm going to collect the entire 
the entire collection. Uh, it's probably the best Thor comic book ever made, I can say completely and honestly, because it's told in the style of like Memento. You oh, have really? Thor as a Thor as a young man, Thor during the present times, and Thor at the end of time when he's the only living thing left. And it's like, like it, it's fr- the framework is that since Thor is immortal, like you may live forever, but you can't remember everything, so you forget things. Like Thor, even you know, he's like, I forgot my first kiss, my first kill. He's like, I forgot my father's smile because he's been alive so long. And so you have this storyline that spans all of time and it's intercut with like the three versions of him. And like you, you encounter that thread. It keeps intersecting. It's, it's amazing. Like it's really good. It's about um, this guy called the God butcher who is killing every pantheon from every religion ever. Like he will kill all gods from all realities. It's amazing. So yeah, cool. that's what I'm doing. What's what's the episode? Right. So the episode this week, as I hinted at last episode, I, I was sort of sitting at home thinking um, about two three months ago, and I asked myself, what was the first movie I actually ever saw at the movies? And I had to really think about it, and it was like a lost lost memory. It came back to me, and I thought, holy crap, that's right, that's what it was. And it got the thought rolling about, and I'll go into what that movie was in a little bit, about wh- how, what impact this movie had. And then I thought, holy crap, I've actually been impacted throughout my whole life by this genre that we're going to talk about today, and that is the genre of musicals. Now, I make the joke quite regularly that uh, today's episode's three heterosexual males talking about musicals. And there's I'm ready. A, okay. Uh. There you go. And there's a quite a cultural divide in society that, for some reason, it is quite difficult for men to talk, actually, men, men who actually like musicals to actually talk about it. Now, it's acceptable if you're gay and you openly talk about musicals. There's sort of a cultural acceptance of that. But if you're heterosexual males, male, you either sort of pretend that, no, nah, you don't like everybody else, you don't like it, or that uh, we'll just talk about sports instead, or you just don't bring it up at all, really. You're only allowed to talk about Blues Brothers. <laughs> or, or, or that you're only talking about. Absolutely, there's a lot of assumptions, but those assumptions are generally built on a reality. Because I can tell you now, in 48 years, I've not had a single uh, discussion with another male until today about musicals. Man, I had a very different childhood. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I've spent many a night not only watching with my male friends, but talking about musicals. I like, spent the sixth grade talent show singing songs from The Lion King. Yeah, and I'll get I'll get into again into my musical experiences as a as a uh, adolescent growing up. So let's go right to the beginning, and I'm going to give you a definition of musicals. And not that it's going to sort of enlighten anybody on what a musical is. Everybody's generally well aware. It's a stage, television or film production utilizing popular style songs, dialogue optional to tell a story. Nothing new there. But the reason why I bring this up is that um, there is an alternative definition out there that basically says, and this comes from diehard musical fans, aficionados, that basically says that if the production, if the characters in the production actually acknowledge that they are singing or that they want to sing or that they are about to sing, then it's actually not a musical. It's a production with music in it, which as far as I'm concerned, is a little heavy-handed. 
because if That's you say pedantic, it is very pedantic. Because if you say to people, you know, uh, name your musical, most of the most of the musicals they bring up fall into that category. That says it's not a musical. So if I say uh, name a musical and you say sound of music. Sound of Music is technically not a musical because those characters refer to themselves as singing or they ask Maria to sing them a song, etc. It is very Yeah, pedantic. I don't... It, I'm I not going to buy that. That's dumb. <laughs> it is very pedantic, but the definition does exist out there. I just wanted to bring it up. It's not that I believe in it. I, for me, if part of that story is being told through song and through music, for me, it's a musical. So... I just wanted to just put it out there. That's fine. Um, well, that's go on. See, like I don't understand because, like, there is no, there is no other time in a film where someone just like if if part of the narrative vehicle for events is someone singing, like at the end of the song, they've been singing about traveling or something and then they are somewhere else the music literally was the vehicle for that narrative moment like (laughs) no that's fine like 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 lion king hakuna matata that song is the movement of his maturation of him growing older and at the end you know the the song is how they did that like it has nothing to do with whether they knew they were singing or not no, no, and that's fine. It's more that the, do the characters themselves acknowledge that they were singing? Do they acknowledge, do they ask for a song to be sung? You know, that sort of thing. The children in Sound of Music who turn to Maria and say, Maria, sing us a song, rules that out of being a musical. It's not them breaking into a song. But that, that's So fine. Mary Poppins isn't a musical. Those people can die. True. <laughs> That's true. Because that's one of my favorites. There you go. Um, And there's basically two types of musicals. There's the musical that sort of fits more along the opera line of things where the whole production is sung. So there's actually no spoken dialogue like Les Miserables where the entire production from beginning to end, the entire story is told through song. And then there's the um, genre that fits more, fits better for film, and that's to have a combination of song and dialogue, spoken word. So, why do I like musicals? Well, I thought about this. And musicals for me is that there's a joy that I get. There's a joy in a musical, even the most, some of the more dour musicals like Rent, or even if you take Les Miserables, which ends quite miserably, so to speak. <laughs> um, Dying from tuberculosis. Um, there's still moments of pure joy in that, and the musical, the, the musical genre is able to bring that joy out in ways that um, other other forms for me don't achieve. Yeah, like uh, there's awesome, profound saying, no joke that I found on Reddit, that art is how humanity decorates space and music is how humanity decorates time. Yeah. And there's something like, I don't care who you are, if you're a human being, you like some kind of music. Like there is some tune yes. somewhere, even if it's even if it's as abstract as a bird, like tweeting. That is a song that you enjoy. It, right. It's like very universally understood. Like you don't have to know music to enjoy it. Whereas like with art and stuff, a lot of times people have to explain to you why it's <laughs> so fantastic. True. You're just not looking at it right. It's like, no, you can hear, and you can hear beauty, and you can recognize it. It's very easy. Yep, that's, that's actually very well put. Um, and to go, to go along with what James just said there, singing is able to capture or create a passion, 
a moment, a sense of emotion that dialogue of, often doesn't achieve. And, and those moments in musicals is what sort of captures me, uh, engrosses me, makes me empathize with the moment or with that character. So there's the joy and there's the passion. Well, and also with music specifically, um, with speech, we only have the context of where the words are in the, in the sentence and the context, the environment that we're saying it in. With music, there's way more context, like way more context. There's the beat that it falls on, the note that it that it's sung at, the yes. accompanying music that brings it up. You can make it sad or happy or anxiety with dissonance. You can bring harmony. You can play to a tonic. You can build stress and relieve it. So much more stuff that you cannot do by just speaking a sentence. Yep, absolutely. And lastly, on a more personal level, is I am completely envious of anybody who can sing and dance. And if you can sing and dance at the same time, you have my full admiration. Now, I, there's other things I can't do. I can't play an instrument. I can't you know, imitate voices, say, like James does. I'm, I'm quite envious of those people, but the people I'm most envious of is somebody who can sing to a tune, who can dance at the same time. And to see these people do that for me it just has my full admiration so oh you heard it here veet admires chris brown i'm disgusted <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> well there's there, there's a, a question as to how much they can actually sing and dance at the same time when you when you hear the the um off clips of people like um oh what's the the uh, um Oh, crying out loud. Britney Spears, there you go. Of Britney Spears on stage where there's a side microphone actually catching her singing and dancing and she can't do both. She can. She's dancing away on stage and she's doing that well and choreographed perfectly. But when you actually listen to her singing, she's way off. And well, she's huffing the thing, and puffing, and it's just not doable. And yet, when you see somebody on a stage production of a musical doing it, and they can sing and they're dancing at the same time, like you have my absolute admiration. Go on, James. Well, I was going to say, like, like there, there's a, there's the just the physics of singing and dancing. Oh yeah, yeah. Like you can feel the jar you can hear the jarring of your body in your voice when you're like jumping around. <laughs> like it oh, makes absolutely. a warble. Absolutely. So yeah. Uh, and it and it is a very, very difficult thing to do. So hats off to all those people. So where did it all begin? Now I've talked here about how um in my growing up in the household that I did, going to the movies was seen as frivolous uh, and is not something you did. You spent money on frivolous things. Art and culture is the Art greatest sin. <laughs> it wasn't a sin. It was just seen as just a waste of money, time and money. You know, It was fine for people who had time and money to do it, but if you didn't have time and money, it was a waste. So... Um, I've talked here about my father's influence in my life, my mother's influence. We haven't talked about much at all. My mother tells the story of her first ever trip to the movies. It was a school outing. They all got loaded on the bus to go see The Sound of Music. And this for her was not only just a big adventure of the going on the school trip and going to the finally getting to go to the cinemas, but then seeing on the big screen the sound of music. And being a good Catholic girl that she is, uh, would have lapped that up, that whole, that whole story. So much so that 
TV in Australia in the 60s, well, I want to say 70s. 70s and in, in, into the 80s, growing up in that household that I did, like clockwork, played Sound of Music once a year. You you knew it was coming. It was just a case of waiting for the uh, advertisements on TV for them to announce that we're playing Sound of Music. And I've mentioned how my father basically dominated the television. This was one of the very few times my mother actually got to have a say on what we watched on television. So if it was Sound of Music Night, it was Sound of Music Night, and we were all watching it. Now, as a, a boy and a young teenager, sure enough, you know, the, I'd see the ads and I'd go, here it comes again. We're going to watch Sound of Music again. And I'd sort of groan and I'd moan and my eyes would roll. But sure enough, I'd actually park myself in front of the television with the rest of my family. And with all in between all the sighing and groaning and eye rolling, I was watching The Sound of Music and enjoying it. So that's basically where it started for me. Then it was actually, I was at school and it was my first time my first ever experience at going to the movies was again at a school trip. We were all loaded on the bus. First big adventure into a, a movie cinema for me. And we got parked in front of the screen. And on the screen came Fiddler on the Roof. Now, my, my existence was blown three ways on that day. One... I learnt the magic and the power of watching a movie on a big screen. We, and we were parked up quite close to the front because we were the school kids and it didn't matter that we, we, were, we certainly weren't given the best seats in the house. So we were all parked up close to the front so we were like parked directly underneath this big screen and we got to experience the big picture, the big sound. And this was just like a, a revelation for me. Secondly, it was an exposure to a, a culture of people that I had only ever heard of growing up in a Catholic society, in Catholic culture that I was, and these were the Jewish people, who at that time in the Catholic Church were vilified as the the people who basically crucified Jesus. So they were in my limited, naive, ignorant, I'll use both words there, um, existence, I was watching a movie about the bad guys. But what quickly became apparent to me is that, and Fiddler, um, Fiddler on the Roof is basically the story of um, a community of Jewish people growing up in Russia in the early 1900s and the persecution that they were under at that time. And it sort of was a, a great revelation to me about these these weren't bad people. These were people no similar to ourselves who basically, you know, cared about family and friendship and doing an honest day's work and wanting to uh, exist and be, you know, coexist in the society as equals with along with everybody else. And then lastly, it sort of entrenched in me the power of the musical. The 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 songs the the passion that was created, the joy that was created in some of the songs that were performed. Um, I'm trying to think of Tom Head, tradition. Um, if I were a rich man, all songs that basically were able to do that, create that passion, create that sense of emotion. Uh, you know, trying to communicate where they were at in that story through as James explained, through the song and the music that accompanied it. And then lastly, as you know, I'm heading into my early teens, another musical hits big time in Australia. 
and that is the musical Grease. I was about to say Grease. <laughs> <laughs> it was so big in Australia because of Olivia Newton-John performing in that production. None of my family got to see it, at, went to see it at the movies, or not, not that I'm aware of. We didn't see it until it came to television. But the music was like, all her songs were just like number one hits on the charts in Australia. And it predominantly, well, it wasn't predominantly. It had to do because of the fact that we had one of our own, our own star in this movie, and that was Olivia Newton-John. And she, at this point in her career, she just, you know, went through the roof. I mean, she had performed, had, you know, released singles in Australia and was successful in her own right in Australia. But now we had our own world star because of her performance in this movie. And I'll, I'll get a, more, a bit more into Greece, nitty gritty of Greece a little later. Um, so that was basically it, sort of like, from about the age of six to the age of twelve, those three, those three experiences, basically shaped my understanding and my enjoyment of musicals. Then I get to my late teens, and my late teens, the Catholic boys' school that I'm going to, now has just gotten a new arts block a school that was about 70 plus years old at this, this point, all the buildings were starting to get a little dilapidated. We got funding for a new arts block and this brand new shiny new building was created and it was three wings. There was a woodworking, which is not really arts, but there was a woodworking shop. There was an art studio and there was a, a theater slash drama room. Our drama teachers just his whole experience had just changed because now he had a brand new, fully functional, small, but very usable working space theatre that he could now use. So when I was in year nine, he decided he was going to have a school production and he chose Greece. Fair enough. He chose Greece. Now, I was completely all oblivious to this. I actually missed the the roll call, missed the fact that he was actually creating it. He brought in a girls' school to play, help play the female parts. And it wasn't until I found out what, what, that one of my mates was actually performing in it that I, A, knew that it was happening, and two, decided I was going to go see it. And I went and saw it. And I enjoyed it, but I thought, hmm, this is very mediocre. This is very ordinary. This is nothing like the movie Grease. And I didn't have a sense of what it was to, to create one using teenagers, using amateur actors, very amateur actors, uh, using people with varying singing abilities to try and create a production that you were going to present to an audience but there was still a sense of awe for me in seeing it just the ability from my seeing my classmates have the guts to actually get on stage and perform in front of an audience attempt to sing in front of an audience and dance in front of an audience just just sort of I was again in awe of my, my colleagues, my, my fellow students. Next year comes around and the drama teacher announces that he's going to do another school production and this time it's West Side Story. I'm taking drama at this point and I decide, hell yeah, I'm going to be in West Side Story. Except I can't sing and I can't dance. I'm six foot one at this point and I'm built like a, as we say in Australia, a brick shit house. So I quickly get typecast into playing the adult roles. And the adults don't sing in West Side Story. It's only the teenagers that sing, thankfully, I guess. So I play uh, Lieutenant Shrank in West Side Story. There's a problem with this production. And that is that besides the lead, the 
the the male lead, the guy he chooses to play Tony, nobody else can sing or wants to sing. Now, there's a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of male ego. He's trying to break through a lot of, um, you know, or oh, I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to sing in front of a, uh, an audience. But these are all people. And I'll be honest, the majority of, us, of the guys that were there who chose to be in the production was because it gave us a chance to work with girls. Again, a a girl school was brought in to um, play the female parts, and that meant a, a lot of the guys said, yeah, yeah, I'll be in the production, I'll be in the production, but weren't prepared because it gave them a chance to hang out with girls, but they weren't prepared to do what it needed to be done to create this production. And I, I feel sorry for my drama teacher because I'm sure he was beating his head against the wall, wondering what the hell he was going to do. In the end, this is what he had to do to get the production done. The girls sang their parts. The girls sang and danced their parts. That wasn't a problem. The boys had to mime to the tracks from the from the movie production for the, our school production. So the boys would come out and mime and mediocrely dance to their parts just so that he could get this production done. It wasn't great. It was acceptable. The parents all sort of clapped and applauded and cheered at the right moments, but I'm sure there was a lot of sort of grunting and eye rolling in the audience. Though this one thing, so much so, this was my drama teacher beat his head against the wall so badly that in the following year's production, he said, screw it, I'm just doing Rebel Without a Cause. So there was no singing, no dancing. He could just handpick the boys he wanted to play the parts who he knew could act, and he could get the production done that way. Yes, he brought in uh, a girls' school as well, but at least he didn't have to at least worry about the music and the dancing and trying to encourage, uh, trying to, you know, coax out from the guys any chance of them getting to sing or dance on stage. What this did do, do for me, though, was it created, I was introduced to West Side Story for the first time, and this has basically is my all-time favourite musical. West Side Story. I just, I loved it. I sort of took it all in. There was a local art house cinema that was showing a a screening of West Side Story. So a small group of us from the musical went off ourselves to go watch it. Um, I found whatever copies of the music I could. I learnt and read all about Leonard Bernstein. I le read and learnt all about Stephen Sondheim, two of sort of the, the gods of musicals, particularly in the 60s and 70s. It's so much so that I even bought, at that time, um, coincidentally, and thankfully for me, uh, Leonard Bernstein had released an anniversary album of West Side Story. I can't remember what anniversary it was. It would have been something like a uh, 30-year anniversary where he actually recorded, he conducted, excuse me, he conducted the musical for the first time for a studio recording of West Side Story. And on it had... Um, Jose Carrera singing the male lead and Kirit Kanawa, who's a very famous uh, female opera singer in this part of the world, uh, singing the female lead. So it was quite operatic, um, but it gave a full sense of what Leonard Bernstein was trying to achieve with his musical. Because for the movie, they they jazzed it up. They jazzed the music up obviously to appeal to a, a larger audience than a a stage theatre-going 
audience would be more interested in or less interested in, I should say. So they jazzed it up so that what we played on our school production was a much more jazzier version and what Leonard Bernstein had created for the stage was sort of more operatic. And then I undertake a musical drought. I sort of leave high school, I go to university, I start my new job and is a real drought until I meet Claire, Claire, my wife, who has her own passion for musicals, quite different to mine. Um, she living in London for about two to three years, frequently visited West End in London and basically was able to devour West End scene in London uh, whenever she could get tickets and she will always refer to these two musicals as being her favorites and the ones she sort of devoured during this time and they were Les Miserables and Phantom of the Opera which at that point in time was her absolute favorite and she had a, a real crush for Michael Crawford which really helped and she would talk about her passion her experience and her passions of musicals and and I, I would sort of feign, well, not a feign interest, but I didn't want to be seen to be too enamored of musicals. I just sort of like throughout all this time where she was talking about her interest and her love of musicals, I would just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I did a school, I was in a school production, but I didn't sing and I didn't dance. And, you know, but I didn't sort of, I wouldn't fully reveal, um, sort of my my underlying passion for musicals. I was very standoffish. Then along came Samantha. And I think Samantha rubbed more off Claire than me for her passion of musicals that eventuated. Um, a lot of that, I will take claim, probably had to do with me because of our, our, our love of Disney animated movies of which a significant number of them are musicals. And then she discovered, much to my chagrin, uh, the love of a uh, high school musical, which was on play. It was basically played ad infinitum on the Disney Channel. And she just devoured these. And I think I even relented and took it to see High School Musical 3 at the movies because, because I'm a good dad. <laughs> Um, I, I, uh, yeah. And again, they were, and th they were fine. Uh, you know, a key thing about being a, a, a good dad is spending time with your kid. And sometimes that means sitting in front of the television, watching stuff that they really want to watch. And I will admit here that I have seen all three of the high school musical movies, but only because I was doing the good thing as, as a dad. Way to take one for the team. There you go. Sure enough, she goes into school herself and she gets uh, a love for, dr uh, for drama as well. And sure enough, she starts to get herself involved in the uh, school productions. First of all, being Greece, which when you sit back as an adult and you watch your teenage kids teenage daughter as well as the other teenage kids performing Greece you realize how inappropriate Greece is as a school production <laughs> I understand why it's done because the songs are great songs but the story is appalling the story tell is more, a, tell me more uh, have they no, pressed charges yet <laughs> it's about basically it's about teenage conformity and slut shaming that's what the story is and my, Claire and I are just standing, sitting next to each other going, this is terrible. How can they even think about <laughs> this as a teenage production? But you understand why. The songs are great. They're, and it's, yeah, easy, it's easy to get teenagers interested in performing them, performing a musical, if the music and the, the songs are great. Yeah, yeah. but there's a, there's a lot of things that are like that. I mean... Um, there, there are a lot of very popular songs, like Imagine, 
for example, by John Lennon. It sounds great. Actually take the time to read those lyrics and consider what they mean. <laughs> you know, and you kind of go, this is not at all what I thought it was. Yeah. Huh. What's wrong with the match? One of my favorite songs. Oh, it's it's just the um, a man who's one of the richest people in America is talking about not having possessions and then basically saying there's no heaven and there's no hell. And it's not. No, it's not he even... said, imagine if there's no yes. religions to fight. Yeah, for, I understand that. No country borders to defend. Yeah, I understand. He's what not he's asserting saying. anything. He's just imagining. Right, but if you imagine it to their logical conclusions, it's a longer discussion. But yeah, anyways, it's just like. But but my point is, a lot of people when they're listening to that song, it's not what they think it is. The the songs themselves, it's it's. It's more the yeah. It's the underlying story. The songs on an individual basis in Greece are great individual songs, but as a as a story, Greece is terrible. She then <laughs> went on to um, perform in Wizard of Oz. Now, thankfully, my daughter can sing and can dance so much so that because of her age and sort of school hierarchy. Um, she was too junior to get lead parts and lead songs. But in uh, this year's performance, she's performing in Man of Steel, which is a non-DC um, Superman musical. Um, she's actually getting to sing her a solo, and she's actually sing- and the actually the song she sings is the opening song to the to the musical. So she's in full swing in the rehearsals. Of that at the moment, um, I'm 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 really proud of this kid. I just, like I said, I'm envious of people who can sing and dance, and she can sing and dance, and I'm I can't wait to to see this production. All right, guys, I'm going to throw it to you guys here for a bit. I've talked a good solid thirty minutes here about me and my experience with musicals. I'll start with James because at least James will be positive to start off with. James, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. So, uh, yeah, what's I've your experience had, with musicals? Uh, musicals have actually been a large part of my life, especially my childhood. Uh, this is through my late uh, great aunt, like my favorite aunt ever, who was very much into music and art. She was an artist, and she loved singing and. Like, we would go over to her house and we would just sometimes just spend nights just playing guitar and singing out on the back porch. Like, it was amazing. And she introduced me at a very young age to uh, a lot of Disney films, such as Mm -hmm. Mary Poppins. And I grew up loving those songs, loving singing them. Like, it stuck with me my whole life, growing up into early... Uh, as an early teenager, listening to things like Grease, like you said, which was awful. Uh, stuff like Sound of Music, uh, Blues Brothers, which is like, I don't know. It's the sneakiest musical ever made because yep. it's like you don't realize you're going to be watching a musical. And then it's amazing. And you have all of these famous people in it that are like the the god tier level of their their art <laughs> like just in one movie freaking Ray Charles man <laughs> and uh yeah like I don't know I've always I've you know I think it's mainly because I come from a musically inclined family just a lot of southern porch sitting and playing music it's like a big part of the culture here and um what's funny is I ended up my college that I went to, uh, they have a non-traditional kind of homecoming thing because we have a charter against football. Like we will not against. allow football on campus. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, it was signed very early to mm-hmm. to a charter banning football from campus. And so, where other people use some kind of big home game as a an event for people to come back to, instead. We have the oldest college tradition in America, hands down, like the first college tradition, and it's called College Night. 
And it's two teams, a purple side and a gold side. They are given a script for a musical. They have a single week to learn, create the outfits for, create the props, and get the music made for an entire musical in a week. Wow. And then in one night, both teams come together. They do their production, and then it's a vote to see who did the best and which side won for that year. And it is the most insane thing I think I've ever been to. Like, every, everybody who graduated comes. All the alumni from all over, all over the country, sometimes out of the United States, they come home for college night. Like, I've seen people like 70s and 80s, people from way back graduated. And everybody gets so into it. Both sides have a song that they sing before the productions begin. So, like, the gold side, they all join hands. If you're, all, if you're rooting for gold, you all join hands and you sing your song. And then the purple side all joins hands and they sing their version of a song. Right. And it the song even dates back to like Yale, like talking about woofa poofs and stuff like that. Like it is an old song, and it, the camaraderie, the the inclusion, the community there. I will never experience anything like that at a football game. Like where ever, like it is the loudest thing I've ever been to because people are screaming so hard when their side is playing and they're making shots at each other's side and the songs and stuff that the building is literally shaking from the sound of everyone. Awesome. It is phenomenal. And it is one of the purest uh, expressions of creativity that I've ever seen. Just seeing my, my classmates go and work so hard on something that's done once they have one time that they do that production and then it's gone until next year they make a totally original and new production with a new theme like it is intense and amazing and i'm glad that my wife convinced me to take part in it because like as much as i like musicals i've never been kind of i've never been a joiner mm-hmm. i'm never someone who's like oh everybody's do this thing let's let's go do that and she wanted to do it because she started as a theater major at school. And that was something she was a part of. And I was like, yeah, let's go. And it was incredible. Like awesome. the fact that I got to experience something that, that happens nowhere else in America is very profound and very fun. Sounds cool. It does. That, that sounds awesome. Uh, some examples of uh, musicals that you that you really I, like. I'll, I'll tell you my favorite one okay, right now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dr. Horrible sing along blog. The yes. greatest thing to ever happen from the writer strike. That, that please explain. S- have you not seen this? No, I have not seen this. Mother of God. Bill! <laughs> so, okay. So, I'm linking this in our discord right. right the hell now. So there was several years back yes. a writer's strike in Hollywood where they refused to work. So what this did, this completely threw off the production of every show in Hollywood at the time, television shows, movies, you know, like everything. Well, Joss Whedon was like, hey, <clears throat> guys, you, you guys aren't doing anything. He calls out all his friends. And he's like, uh, Neil Patrick Harris, um, Nathan Fillion, like he gets the crew together, Felicia Day, and he goes, let's make a musical. And he writes and directs an online released musical called Dr. Horrible's Sing Along Blog. And it is about a supervillain portrayed by Neil Patrick Harris falling in love with a woman who becomes enamored with Sergeant Hammer, who is Neil Patrick Harris. Sergeant Hammer is the superhero who constantly stops Dr. Horrible. Nathan Fillion. 
Nathan Fillion is an absolute galactic level dick bag in this. It's amazing. He is awful. Like he is a terrible human being in this. And it's Dr. Horrible basically loving Felicia Day's character from afar and lamenting it and trying to find some way to impress her. It is amazing. Okay. I to the point that Dr. Horrible's song I used in my wedding album. No, it, it's one of those you need to you need to like when this is over. Sure. You you need to sit down with your family. It's like forty five minutes long. You need to watch this. You will appreciate having done so. Okay. Yeah. It is it, incredible. Like they it, it's one of those things where number one, they didn't even know that if they could pull it off. And it's all original music written by Joss Whedon. Like it the man if you want to see some pure talent uh, and flexibility, just watch watch that. It's okay. the best. Also, Bad Horse. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Apparently the, the world of evil is led by a bad horse named Bad Horse. It is literally a horse. It's yeah, just it's a horse. bad. It's a bad horse though. Very bad. It's like, oh my god, I got a letter from Bad Horse. <laughs> It and was... there's there's actually quite the message associated with it as well. Uh, I won't I won't spoil it, but let's just say that it's quite it's it's quite the moral. Okay, Robert. What about the world of musicals in Robert's world? Little Shop of Horrors. Okay. Bas- basically, it's my my thing with musicals. Yeah. I don't dislike them. My thing with musicals is I don't understand why everyone starts singing. And and this is like a weird this is a weird like schism for me because I don't mind it. In fact, there are several movies where I think they only work because of the singing. Um and yet I I cannot justify it. I cannot watch it and appreciate it as something that would happen, you know, obviously, I mean, clearly suspension of disbelief, but so many times there's not even like, you know, an in real justification or anything else where it's just, well, people just, you know, they, they express Boosting emotion the by, by, yeah, they express emotion by, by, by singing. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kind of sitting over here off to the side going, yeah, I guess they do. <laughs> well, you're also missing a very important historical context. Oh, I'm not missing to it. Musical, <laughs> to musicals in general. You've never been in a pub full of Scotsmen. <laughs> <laughs> they will sing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, no, I've, I've like been. Shanties I've been and stuff. stuff. Like, yeah. like there, there was a time in past history when oration was all we had where people really would just start singing about what was happening. Yeah. Like, that's where the bard came from. It's why we ever had the idea of singing a story. Oh yeah. No. And that's like that. I'm totally there with you. I get it. Believe me. But you know, I mean like they talk about, um, I haven't seen it, but La La Land, I've seen clips of, of some of the numbers and stuff. It's like, we're stuck in LA traffic. It's burst into song. Yeah. I'm just not there. Now with we're flying that. through space. <laughs> I'm true. just, I'm not there with you. You know, it's like, I'm watching this scene. I'm just like, Nope. Uh uh-uh. uh, and 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 like and like it's a weird schism because there's a lot of movies that I think only work because of the musical numbers. Um, I mentioned immediately Little Shop of Horrors. Um, it's my favorite musical. It's demented as shit. Mm-hmm. Um, it. I mean, have you seen it? Uh, I've seen like, parts of the, the whole thing. The stage play or the movie? I've watched part. it so long ago that yeah. I actually forgot. All I know is that I watched it, and it has Rick Moranis in it. Rick Moranis, yes. Um, and, it's a it's a great film, um, in my opinion. But it's one of those things like it is dark humor, like you wouldn't believe. Um, and the the uh, movie that was made by Warner Brothers, um, starring Rick Moranis, was actually directed by Frank Oz, who you know as the puppeteer and voice of Yoda. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and and it was I think at the time like the most expensive movie Warner Brothers had ever made. So like it was not it was not like a a um, 
you know, throwaway project. Like they were making a musical and it was serious business, you know, and they were doing it as little shop of horrors and, and little shop of horrors is a story about a, a little plant that is an alien that gets picked up by uh, Seymour, who is this perpetual loser. Like he's, he's just a total loser and he works at a plant shop and he's, he has the hots for the, um, the, the checkout clerk who works there too, but he's, you know, he's such a loser. He can't bring himself to, you know, get her attention. And she's obsessed with this, um, psychotic dentist. Um, but anyways, he finds this plant and through circumstance discovers that it can only survive through blood. Like he starts like cutting himself and dripping little bits of blood into it. And then it will grow and prosper. It keeps getting bigger and bigger until the point where it starts to talk to him and it starts telling him, Hey, I can make you rich and famous. All you've got to do is kill people and feed them to me. Yeah. And it's a plant that like you, you're like, Oh, the Mario potted plant, piranha, piranha plants. Yeah. And it's stage plays uh, have different designs, but in the movie, yeah, it's, it's just it's this great big bulb of, of teeth. Yes. Um, and it talks rudely. <laughs> Feed me see more. Yeah. And, um, circumstances occur he keeps winding up around dead bodies and he chops them up and feeds them to the plant um and it's uh, the movie's actually kind of notorious because there were two versions um because you know when you're talking about musicals you know you've mentioned movies and stage plays um stage plays have an advantage as a musical that films do not which is when the play is over the cast comes out and takes a bow this sure. is huge. This is huge, especially in the case of this play. Because in the original stage play and in the original version of the film, everybody dies. The plant wins. Right. And in the original cut of the movie, the plant even um, wins to the degree of spreading across the country and then they all become giant Godzilla-sized plants that destroy cities. And you watch this happen and it's hilarious. Um but it feels really odd because everyone's dead by that point. They don't come out to take a bow. They're just dead. And when they had originally made the movie and they were doing the test screenings before release, um, everyone was loving the film and said it was great. And then the two leads die. The plant wins. There's still like 10 minutes of the movie left. And everyone basically went, well, that was a piece of shit. And gave it, like, huge marks down. So to great expense, they rewrote and refilmed the entire ending so that Seymour comes out on top. Um, and Interesting. Yeah. And so in that way, it differs from the stage play. But it's also, like, an interesting case study in how the two mediums are different. different yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't do in one to the same degree what you can do in the other, um, and it, and it is just that fact that you know they can the 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 cast can come back and reveal themselves, take the bow. Oh, there's the character that I liked. He's still there, kind of, sort of, you know, suspicious disbelief, all that. Um, and you don't get that in a movie; they're just dead. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is there are other movies um, where while they are totally musicals, I just don't care. Um, 10, for example, brought up one of my absolute favorite movies ever, which is Blues Brothers. I love that film. I watch that film regularly. That movie's amazing. I don't care one iota that anybody sings in that film. Not one bit. Um, I don't mind it. I enjoy it. I think it's great. Look, sequence, it is a wonderful. musical that's redefined the car chase scene. Yes, I was about to say that's that's <laughs> the thing about that film. The <laughs> thing about right that film. No, the thing about that film is you watch that. If you really watch the humor in that movie, is incredible. Like when they start getting just like whipped by the by the nun with the ruler, with the yardstick, and they're like, oh, God, and they're, like, stuck in the chair, they can't get out, they fall down the stairs, and she's like, you will do the thing! And then she just glides backwards, and the door closes on itself through the grace of God. It's just like, whoa. <laughs> you know? And then they're running around, they're the, like, the, we, the, we the black Pentecostal God. church where they're slam-dunking yeah! basketballs. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, you know, or, or like, a, oh, you know, we cannot be stopped. We're on a mission from God. We're on a mission from God. Yeah. And, you know, and like all the cameos and everything else. Also, how they just, they piss off everyone. I mean, like, they, they, they took off the good old boys, which I think is great, which is one of my favorite scenes ever in any movie, when the police officers see them speeding off, they're like, oh, let's get them, and they pull out right into the good old boys truck, and they collide. <laughs> I love that. Um, and then there's also, goddamn, Illinois Nazis. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and I just and they make everybody angry, even the local Nazi party. You know, I love this movie. <laughs> this movie is fantastic. The fact that people sing throughout it is just kind of there. It's just a bonus. Yeah, but on the flip side, you know, going back to Little Shop of Horrors, Little Shop of Horrors is garbage if no one sings. It's the most boring movie. <laughs> they're, they're, the movie, the movie yeah. would be nothing. True. The movie would be absolutely nothing if nobody sings during Little Shop of Horrors. So, I mean, like, I'm there. I I get it. I can enjoy a musical. But even with Little Shop of Horrors, I'm just kind of like, why are you singing? It's strange. You know, and, and that's why um, I posted that image for you guys. Um, Flynn Rider from the Disney film Tangled is infamous for being the only Disney character ever to question why anybody is randomly singing. There's that scene where he and Rapunzel go into the tavern, everyone breaks out in a song, and he's just like, what is going on? <laughs> and I I really enjoyed that. Which, by the way, um, just a random factoid, Tangled is one of the most expensive movies ever made. It was, wasn't it? It cost them over $200 million. Because think, they kept they kept they kept aborting and restarting and aborting and restarting, and by the time they actually made a movie, true. they'd spent over two hundred million on it. True. But yeah, just just random tidbit. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's it's those things. I mean, that for me are just odd. I I don't understand like the suspension of disbelief that's required. I can suspend the disbelief, but I don't understand it. There is no definition. It's just like. It's kind of this weird thing where, like, you're buying the ticket for the film, you know, to use the parlance, going in there knowing that people will be singing. And nothing in the movie will ever justify this. And I have nothing against that. I just, when I'm looking at the movie in a vacuum, I'm like, this is odd. Except Sister Act. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but but it's just, it just strikes me as an odd thing. I, I, I'm just kind of like, this is a very very bizarre kind of methodology, I guess, towards, towards telling a story to just kind of be like, yes, you're coming here for the explicit purpose to watch people sing. And we all know that let's all agree to do this and just go forward. And I'm just kind of like, okay, interesting. Um, and I mean, you can make that argument for other things, obviously. I mean, you're not going to go to Jurassic Park going, I wonder if there are dinosaurs in this. Yeah. <laughs> that's not, that's not how this works. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not making like a false argument. You know, that's not what I'm trying to do. It's, it's just, you know, Jurassic Park, for example, to use that to use that example, gives you bullshit science to explain why there are dinosaurs. The musical just starts having people sing. True, true. Yeah, you, you see, you see, like, like I was, I was watching a, um, oh, I can't remember what it was. I was watching a talk show, but there's this guy, and he was talking to a, a film critic, and they were they were arguing the merits of kind of a similar discussion that we're having. They were arguing the merits of uh, musicals versus other things like comic book movies. And the, and both of them couldn't understand why audiences could accept the Hulk turning into a big green guy, but they couldn't accept La La Land. And I'm like, because Bruce Banner turning into the Hulk is explained by gamma radiation. It literally takes two sentences and you've explained it to me. I will accept it. The musical just starts singing. Well, also saying gamma radiation depends on your ignorance of how radiation works. Oh, absolutely. True. <laughs> True. Totally. Like gamma radiation. Sounds about right to me. It's in the water. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, I mean, my, my dad used to do nuclear submarine stuff and like they would give, they would give you those, those Geiger counters and they would like measure how much radioactivity you've been exposed to. And it's like, don't leave it next to a granite rock. You'll, you'll, you'll top the Navy's limit. They won't let you come back in. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like, you mean that rock that's outside my front porch? Yeah. No one knows how radiation works. It's hilarious. But, 
Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's just there's that suspension disbelief that I just I find odd. Like, like we all yeah. we all we all agree to go in there, accepting this. And the movie doesn't try to justify it. The audience doesn't try to justify it. The production crew doesn't try to justify it. it it's just there. No, I agree. I just absolutely there. don't disagree. Makes no effing sense. <laughs> I'll move on from here. I want to talk briefly about stage musicals. For me, stage musicals is the ultimate in a musical production. Seeing a production on stage, live actors... Like I said, singing and dancing without the help of auto tune, uh, live orchestra or band, uh, it all works, comes together like clockwork. It's just an amazing experience. Um, so some of the ones I've seen and I've enjoyed the most, I've actually seen Lion King on Broadway. It was actually very interesting. I was, my wife and daughter were, we were all living in Cleveland at the time. Um, I was a little bored and frustrated with where I was working. I came across the fact that there was quite a lucrative contract, three-month contract in New York. So I decided to take it. It was just outside New York City. And I decided, bugger it, I was going to take it. My wife and daughter stayed back in Cleveland. I went off and did this contract. And for one weekend, we decided we would fly my daughter, who was about six or seven at this stage, to into New York on a plane. I'd pick her up at this end. We had the weekend together. One of those days was spent in Manhattan. We took the train in. It was about 45-minute train ride. We spent the day in Times Square and the doll shop, American American Girl doll shop. Oh, my God, I had to take her there. That's right. It just came back to me this second. And then we ended the day by going to see Lion King on Broadway. And it was just fabulous the costuming the vocals the singing it was how they were able to turn this animated movie into a stage production was just glorious we both we both frequently will reminisce about our experience there unfortunately this part of the world in new zealand um we 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 can get a lot of sort of semi professional productions of musicals and they're great. Um and occasionally what will happen is we'll get a West End or a Broadway production company actually travel out to, out here and put on a stage musical for a limited run. So about four years ago we saw Wicked and that was just great. It was Again, the the quality of production, the quality of the singing, it all it all comes together just fabulously. Two years ago, we went to see Matilda. We were in Melbourne at the time. We went to see Matilda. Now, Matilda on its own is a great little musical. It's a an adapt adaptation of Roald Dahl's Matilda, the children's book. This is this is the closest. I come to having a connection to um, stage musicals to, into stardom. And that is that the person who wrote the musical, who wrote the songs for Matilda, is a guy by the name of Tim Minchin. Tim Minchin's an Australian um, songwriter and producer. Um, he's, a, can, he's amazing. I, he like, is. You just. should see his his um, any of his performance. Just him, yeah, the I'm things he can do on a piano and yes. still talk yeah. is mind blowing. Absolutely, and the reason why I'm in some way related to Tim Minchin, he is my brother in law brother in law's brother in law. So Say what? <laughs> Claire's brother, his brother in law, is Tim Minchin. So that that's as close as I come to fame um that's actually really close to fame <laughs> it's not too bad he was he was actually mc at my brother my brother-in-law's wedding but this wow. was way oh way, God. way back before he was even known at this point he was only known in the state of uh, uh western australia he wasn't even known nationwide it was just starting just starting to break out so that must he, have been a treat it was. It was funny as. It's probably the best wedding MC I've ever ever had. 
So he uh, wrote and produced Matilda. He's just recently written and producing on Broadway. It was been out on West End. It's now out on Broadway called Groundhog Day. So he's made an adaptation of the much loved movie called Groundhog Day as a stage production. I haven't seen it. I can't wait to see it. But there is, it does, it's all wrapped up in his humor and in his um, sort of his vision of how he sees the world. If you want an example, a brief example of Tim Minchin's work, and it's sort of, it's very poignant at the moment with all this, all the talk about fake news and the disregard of science. Um, there's a 10 minute animated movie, which he wrote and performed on called storm. It's on YouTube. You'll find it. If you just type in Tim Minchin and storm, it's a great little, um, 10 minute movie. It's very funny, very apt. And it's very Tim Minchin. It, he's not afraid to express his views and his opinions. Um, and he's not afraid to call people out. And this is what this little 10 minute animated movie is out that does. And, uh, so I saw, uh, Matilda two years ago and I just had a, a great time there. What I have yet to see on stage and would love to see on stage, even though I've, you know, I've seen this movie and is Les Miserables. I have yet to see it. My wife has seen it. She, uh, like I said, adores this. She owns the uh, copy of the, the DVD. She has the 10, 10 year anniversary DVD. She has the 20, 20 year anniversary DVD. You name it, she has it. And I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a room and it's playing in the background. So I, I've, that is one. I've seen the movie. I saw the, the, sort of the straight up film, but with Liam Neeson and I've seen the actual musical production with the, you know, Hugh Jackman and, Anne Hathaway. I've seen that enjoyed it too, but I think seeing this live on stage would be just fabulous. I'm really keen to see Hamilton. Now Hamilton is Sam's favorite. She absolutely adores this. And my wife, I, Every time I get in the car with my wife, it's a struggle. I'm like, you're not playing <laughs> Hamilton again. We're not listening to Hamilton all day. Yeah. I went through this with Wicked. Like, <laughs> I'm not doing it again. Uh, yeah. Like, and and, uh, all right, just on, right, right quick. On. We're yes. talking about Hamilton and Wicked, which are probably the two biggest stage productions that's come out the you know relatively recently in the past sure. few years. Sure. So... Here's the thing I, I hate about stage productions. You can't see them. Like, to, to see Wicked and Hamilton, you had to live in New York. Like, True. pretty much. Yeah. And it wasn't until it exploded that, it, that even Wicked went anywhere. Like, my wife is obsessed with Hamilton. You can't see it outside of physically going to New York. Like, that's the problem I have. Like, you get a really good stage production, and it's like, all right, we're going to listen to this stage production. And it's like, uh, okay, what is the context for what's going on right now? Yeah. They, they like, cut out all the speaking parts. Um, I guess I'll have to imagine what it looks like. Yeah, and to me, that sucks, because yeah. part of it, the enjoyment is being able to see it. Yeah. I I've I know every song to Wicked by heart. I have no clue what it looks like. That's that's a fair point, and it's part of the part of the issue we have living in this part of the world too. We're very remote from those things, and we really are at the mercy of a production company deciding they're going to travel this to this part of the world. Luckily, though, if they they decide to travel to pre perform in Australia, they will performing or at least very at the very least perform in Auckland so we do get a chance to see some of these productions out here go on I was just gonna say like with with rent they made the movie yes so you you can enjoy True. it and they got they got famous people to play it so it's enjoyable to watch it's not the same though yeah it's not the same it's, no, it's nowhere not. near the same experience no. but you're right for some people it is the only way they yeah it's the to. only way you will yeah. ever experience it I think 
I think Wicked came through like last year to to right. near here, and uh, it's also the fact. There's also the fact that if you buy the CDs and you're like listening to it and loving it, those are completely different people than what you see when they come do a production. Like those yeah, people leave true. the production by the time it's on the road, you're delist. Yeah, yeah. You you're That's not true. you're not getting all these these voices that you heard that made it so good. You're getting somebody else. And speaking of productions, in about three weeks, a Broadway production's coming to Auckland, and I finally am going to get to see West Side Story performed on stage. I have my tickets. My wife and Sam are coming along with me, and I am just so thrilled and just so excited to get to see what is, like I said, my most favorite musical. Um, and, it's, and I will admit here that I can actually, I know all the lyrics to all the songs in that musical. And I'm just so, I just can't wait. And it's only here for a two week run. It's like literally fly in, fly out. I heard about it about four months ago and I just said to Claire, we are going and the tickets are not cheap, so I've had to make some compromises. But we are going to go see West Side Story, and I just can't wait. We've mentioned here already in passing, um, I, when we talk about musicals, and people don't necessarily, these don't necessarily come to mind. But when you stop and think about it, you go, yes, of course, they are musicals. And that, and when we're talking about the Disney animated movies, a good majority of those movies are musicals. And, you know, you can, there's a whole heap of them. We can uh, rattle them off. <laughs> Beauty and the Beast and Jungle Book and Lion King and et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're... Hercules. Emperor's New Groove. Did you see, see what I mean? Yep. And as as a kid, and particularly as a kid, or even when you sit down with your kid to watch them, you don't actually stop and think, "I'm sitting down to watch a musical." You're just sitting down to watch a good animated movie, and they're singing and dancing, and it's all that. But you actually don't necessarily make the connection that what you're watching is actually a musical, and they are musicals, and for the most part, they are all very good musicals. Well, that was also because pretty much all of the animated movies were going in that route ever since um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves essentially determined yes. this is yes. how the genre will play out. Right. I mean, American Tale, Five Will Goes West, you know, um, all, all of them, all of them are doing it. All Dogs Go to Heaven, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada. Um, Don Blues, you know, just. I was going to say yeah. Don Blues. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, they were just, they were just doing you know, not to disparage it as saying copycat, but like that was just what the genre was. Yes. You didn't do it another way. Right. Um, and and I, I found it interesting that for the longest time, one of my favorite Disney movies actually was their take on Tarzan until like the last third of it because it becomes very Disney, whereas until that it hadn't been. And one of the things that I found myself appreciating about Tarzan was just that it was so focused on the story that it didn't actually have musical numbers which I found interesting. Mm, like true. they, they started, they bucked their own trend. Um, you know, and I, and I also think it's one of those things too, where that's important. Cause like you, you mentioned, people don't necessarily regard them as being musicals. They are, they are musicals because as Tarzan proves, and as some other things that have come out late later have proven as well. Um, it is not a genre. It is a medium. Right. It is it is it is wrong to say that an animated film is X, Y, or Z. The Japanese would like to have very long conversations with you about that. <laughs> right. Um Oh boy, yes. Yes. Everything. Everything from dramatic from dramatic right. um pieces, romance novels, uh courtroom dramas to porn. They will animate it all. Yep. yep. And and they will do it with more seriousness than their live action productions. Um, which is just strange, but, but yeah, for the longest time though, um, animation and musical was more or less synonymous. And that was, that was just a mistake I felt. And that's been getting, you know, dissolved as time has gone on Pixar, especially true, true. 
when we think of musicals, we tend to think of stage musicals that then went on to become films. And a lot of people um, probably have experienced, probably more people have experienced the musical genre through film than rather through the stage performances. There's the odd few, and there aren't that many really when you think about it. There are some, and I'll, I'll mention a few, where they started off as a film that later then went on to become a stage musical. For examples are Little Shop of Horrors and Blues Brothers we've already mentioned. Hairspray was a film first, and it may, is a great Absolute great stage musical now. John Waters is the strangest human being to live. <laughs> Isn't he just? Isn't he just? But he's so creepy. Uh, yeah, it's true. But that um, that movie and that stage play that came from that movie is just just awesome. And of course, now Disney have made a whole industry of turning their animated movies into Broadway success stories where they've turned all these animated movies into stage performances they slap them on broadway and the production value is just phenomenal and they make another bazillion dollars from uh, this uh, this other form as well and like i've mentioned and then there uh, then there's the productions on ice <laughs> oh, well, well, usually they're not singing. Usually they're just skating around. <laughs> the most songs. anyone's ever seen of Disney on Ice is the commercial for Disney on Ice. <laughs> no, I've been to a Disney on Ice, but then oh, I had God. a six-year-old daughter, so I guess we, we had. <laughs> oh to boy, go. here comes Shrek. <laughs> some no, things should not. No, just, some things should not be musicals, though, like Spider-Man. True. Oh man. What were they thinking? Oh, actually, I heard I heard the Evil Dead one was pretty good. <laughs> they made an Evil Dead one. Wow. Okay. There you go. Um, look, even Trent Reznor of of Nine Inch Nails made a stage musical about a serial killer. <laughs> like, yeah. It's yeah. so weird. There you go. I I will admit here that the the musicals are like less, and it's not gonna. It's not going to endear me with my colleagues here. But the ones I like least, unfortunately, have been uh, Blues Brothers, for one. 2000? No, just Blues <laughs> Brothers straight up. I didn't even venture Wait. anywhere near <laughs> Blues Brothers 2000. Sorry. All right, now you have to watch that one. You shall You shall know the true depth of pain. Uh, you will regurgitate your soul and choke uh, on it. Yeah, no You'll be doubt. lucky to have any bones left after you wretch. No, no doubt. Another one that I didn't enjoy, and I think it was a, a result of the time of when I actually got around to watching it. I actually saw Rocky Horror Picture Show for the first time two years ago. And I think I missed that boat. I missed the time that it came out. I missed the whole um, art house scene that went on with that particular movie of where and funny enough the art house cinema that i did go to quite regularly was doing this it just didn't appeal to me and i never went where it would play that movie every friday night at the same time and people would dress up and people would bring food to throw and sing sing out songs out aloud etc and i just missed that whole boat then so i never got into it when I finally got around to watching it two years ago, I just sort of watched and went, meh, yeah, okay. It just just didn't it didn't connect, it didn't gel. So Can I'm I not... mention yep. a very niche niche genre of musical? Go on. And that's musical television shows. Oh yes. Like okay. I I absolutely and, and I don't mean shows that have music like the voice or Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know what you mean. Connected. Top, yeah. You're, you're talking about television shows that are almost inevitably doomed to failure. Well, well, outside of Glee, yeah, exactly. Which I did not, I didn't like that show. I did not like that show one bit. It it relied too much on becoming topical and, and whatever. And it I, it, music it I was never really liked. 
it was everything I hate about most television just wrapped up in a musical format, so it did not appeal to me whatsoever. So I want to talk about... Oh, sorry. Go, go, go. (laughs) I I was just going to say, the one musical television show that I actually watched and liked, I, I mean... Outside as an not as an honorable mention, but like Flight of the Concords is almost not musical, <laughs> but they're brilliant, like and amazing. But the TV show Gallivant was one hundred percent a musical, and it was canceled after like the second season. But it it was so good. I was not expecting to like it at all, and was just like, "What is this? Some kind of medieval." TV show and I popped on the first episode and it's being self-aware and meta and deconstructive of musicals and I was like oh man Mm -hmm. I love me some Galavant (laughs) never got to see that it was good yeah yeah it was good and they actually ended on a decent note in the second season so I was happy with it It, it's it's hilarious It, it like totally breaks up the whole kind of a lot of tropes from fantasy stories about like the damsel in distress is not in distress. Like she's a wretched human being. (laughs) Like the King is like, I'm going to kidnap you and marry you. And she's like, Oh, thank God. And then he's like the King. (laughs) It's just basically trapped. He's her prisoner. (laughs) Like because of how awful a human being she is. It's really good. And Gallivant's thinking he's in love, and it's like, I'll save the princess. And it doesn't go any way near as planned. And and it's all done with with music. I I will admit admit here that Glee was quite popular in this household. Um, I watched my fair share of it. Um, I... the, The story did nothing for me. I basically watched it for the musical numbers. Um... And it was interesting to see who they would bring on as you know the next guest to sing and dance, etc. The reason, the reason I don't like Glee is the same reason I don't like Big Bang Theory. It doesn't, it doesn't use its subject matter for content. It uses it as a novelty exploitation of the people who would be interested in what it's talking about. Like when they became topical. Sure. Yep. And they have the gay character. They don't have the gay character to to do anything with it. They have the gay character because then gay people will watch the show. That's exploitive of your audience. I never liked the way they would do topical stuff. And then characters would like address some like drug addiction or something. And then the next episode, nothing. There's no callback to what happened last week. Like with bullying or anything like that, they'll have like this emotional episode and a, a character progression and story arc, and then the next episode they've reset back to the way they were, as if that episode never happened. It drove me crazy. Yeah, uh, I I felt very similarly. I had friends who were obsessed with it, and I was living with them at the time, and so I watched my fair share of episodes. And there there were there were just episodes where I was just like, somebody is basically writing their personal agenda as a television episode, like the grilled cheeses episode and stuff like that. Where I'm just like, oh goodness. And see, <laughs> I have no I have no problem with someone making something topical, like like when I watched Luke Cage. It was very much had modern commentary on minority life in America, but it was it it existed in that world, not just as like a topic to attract people to watch the show, but like no, it was part of the framework for why the show could even do anything. Like, yeah, and that's different. Like Harlem really was this way. Things are terrible, but the people that you would think, uh, like, like Glee would prop up that character and be like, oh, look, look how great they are. Look, look, aren't you attracted to this? Because we took this stereotyped list of a human, like, gay, trans, black. Now, now watch our show. No, there were still people in that setting who were bad, who you would look at and be like, yes, this is the circumstance they're in. But they're doing terrible things. So, like, it wasn't like this, you know, novelty blue light special 
on like, oh, let's let's champion this person for this episode. Now let's champion this person. It was like, no, this plays throughout the whole thing. There's consequences to these situations and environments, and there are people having to deal with consequences that their superpower will never save them from. Like Luke Cage handled that way better than Glee ever did. Pretty sure. much. I, I have nothing to argue with here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I, I can't, it, it, that's the one thing that makes me mad about a TV show. And this is just in general. I know I'm kind of going off on a rant, but like Glee really did make me that mad. When I saw them exploiting their characters to do a story about uh, bullying or down syndrome. And then you have, powerful character moments where this really bad person is like, okay, I understand. And then next week it's like, that never happened. Like that. You just exploited people. You weren't trying to do anything to the narrative of your show outside of like, Hey, we need to prop up viewers this week. What's the topic? Hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and that's, that's why, also, yeah. but that's also, that's also an interesting argument. Cause like if, you know, not to deep dive into it, but a, a lot of that also is just, how do you perceive these things? Because there are people, because they do make these things, there are people who are just like, yeah, I was represented. And I'm just like, but that's such a shallow take. Ah, you know? It's pandering. All right. Ex- exploiting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry. To, just, that's all right. I just, I need to mention it. Glee that's just, all right. It that's really right. does touch a, the core of me <laughs> and how people are represented. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start the... the probably the final uh this the talking point for this for this episode and then we can wrap it up and i so i have mentioned it about let's do it the difficulty for heterosexual males to talk about musicals now i understand i'm making a, a, gross, gen, a gross generalization okay i will accept that but i think it's actually a reality it's it's one thing for us three to get on here we are us three have our opinions and we're not afraid to talk about them okay i think we can do we can bring up any topic and we'll the three of us will happily talk about it whether we like it dislike it etc and i'm not talking about the ability for somebody say like robert to say musicals don't do it for me and this is the reason why it's the inability to discuss it at all it's the ability. It's the inability for for a guy to say, um, you know, openly, musicals don't do it for me, and these are my reasons. One, two, three. Okay, they will rather talk about. They go, oh, I'll talk about sports ball. We'll do. We'll talk about sports. What's happening in the footy? I genuinely <laughs> Let's throw down a brownie and then jump on my ute and climb some rocks, mate. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and this is that's not a knife. This is a knife. <laughs> um, I have not had that conversation with anybody, any male. With gay males, yes, absolutely. Now, is this the episode you're... where I find out I'm gay? No, no. <laughs> it's probably the episode I find out. It's probably the episode I find out I'm gay. I've got to go have a talk with Claire. Uh... <laughs> I don't know, man. You uh, we've been a living pop-pop. a lie. You wanted a pop pop at the Dragon Quest yeah, episode. I, I did, think you're I safe. Did. I think I'm safe there, no doubt. Um, okay, guys, tell me I'm talking out of my ass, but that is genuinely my experience. I think that's just anecdotal, sir. I've I've gone my entire life having conversations about everything. A lot of it is just, quite frankly, people don't give a shit. They don't care. They're not going to bring it up in conversation unless somebody asks them, hey, did you go see this thing and what did you think? And then they actually have an opinion. But most of the time, no one's going around saying, hey, have you seen Hamilton? Even people who like Hamilton. Yeah, you know, it's not, it's just, it's just not part of the parlance. And, you know, when I consider like the things that I'm interested in, I am much, much more willing to like at the moment right now, Go to somebody and be like, "Hey, have you seen Wonder Woman? That movie was awesome. You should totally yeah. go see it." That character that happens, was and I'm and you know, and I've had that conversation multiple times already with students and so on and so forth. But you, you know, it's like bringing up a musical. I mean, we talked about La La Land. We talked about how we thought it was overrated. You know, we've we've done a bunch of you know, we've had these discussions. It's just, I mean, people just don't care. Now, I will <laughs> I will put it this way. Um, there is like niches of culture according to where you grow up. 
like here oh, yeah. where I grew up, like my dad was all about football and hunting and guns and you know, like it's like, oh, I'm playing with my Ninja Turtles. Them are Barbie dolls, boy. It's like, uh, no, they're action figures. No, them are Barbie dolls. <laughs> you need to grow them and get a gun. Like these are conversations my dad literally had with me. Like this is a man who found out that a crazy when a, when he found out that a crazy little thing called love was written by why did I oh my god really I forgot George his name Michaels. George Michael uh but it was made famous by um Queen oh crazy like, little thing called love yes yes you're yeah. Right. yeah 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 uh Freddie he Mercury. literally yeah. yeah Freddie Mercury I was just like I was like yeah that's that's a Queen song, Freddie Mercury wrote that. And he literally turns to me and goes, Oh, so such a good song was written by an F word. Mm. Yeah. Like this is the the culture I grew up in. <laughs> We're like, I would never talk to my dad about musicals. Because he'd be like, You're a fruit, why don't you talk to me about NASCAR? And hunting. And like But like among my friends, like the friends that I surrounded myself with, we were meeting up to watch blues brothers or if there was something that we hadn't seen, it's like, Oh dude, you haven't seen blues brothers. No, I've never seen the whole thing. Well, come on, buy some popcorn. This is what we're doing tonight. Like, I, I honestly think it's, it has more to do with like what cultural or culture that you're close to. Cause like, I can see where it'd be a problem. Like if I just shouted out in my high school, like don't love musicals are so good. I would have immediately gotten beat up. It just got jumped. Yeah, yeah, but I was going to say, like, you would have gotten jumped by, like, the two guys who think they've got something to prove. Meanwhile, like, half the hallway's like, yeah, totally, it was great. <laughs> yeah, that guy's a police officer now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But I just, yeah, I just, I just think that's it's an anecdotal thing. Like, it's going to be different for everybody involved. I'm, you know, I'm, that's just how it is. I mean, like I said at the beginning of the episode, my six, like we had talent shows, right? And for sixth grade, uh, there were a couple of uh, friends of friends that, and I were just like out in the playground and we were singing the songs of the Lion King. And we're just like, shit, we're really good at this. We should totally do this as the, as the talent <laughs> show. <laughs> you know? um, and so that's what we did. And there were a lot of people who were like, oh, it was good. It's like, yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, we just, ugh, I, I don't know. It just, it just seems like a really anecdotal thing i mean just the things that people talk about or whatever is happening right now and you know like i i had plenty of people talk about hamilton when it first came out and then no one talked about hamilton because it had moved on yeah like, it's just it's just in the parlance of the moment i think right all the you know in the past like i said there were people if i would have mentioned something like that around be like bleh. but nowadays like Right now, I don't think there's anything I feel unsafe to talk about. Like, my my store manager, when I get to work, he's like, did you see Logan? I was like, I cried like a baby. I was like, that movie destroyed me. And then, you know, I'm sitting there at the cash register. A woman comes through. She's wearing Wonder Woman shirt. I'm like, have you seen the movie? We're going tonight. Good. Go watch it. You know? And no, no, none of the men have been like, you funny, boy? You something wrong with you? Like no. I guess because, like, if anything, it's harder for those people who would say something to say something now because they're vastly outnumbered. <laughs> True. Like them good old boys is just down to the one boy. <laughs> yeah, and and then like where I live up in the Pacific Northwest, that's never really quite been a thing for oh, a very long time. I mean, I've basically only found myself in the last 12 months, 18 months, where I will actually, I don't care who I tell that I, I went to see a musical and that I enjoy Me musicals and have 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 a have a discussion with them. And I just know that prior to then, um, it was certainly not something I was prepared to openly discuss. And a good number of the, the males around me were in a similar circumstance. Maybe but, the problem is you just assume everyone you talk to with musicals is gay. <laughs> maybe. That would be hilarious. That would be hilarious. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like so today's episode, we learned about Veet's prejudices. 
everybody's gay. There you go. Uh, oh, there you go. All right. It's like it's, just had just had a wonderful conversation with that guy over there about uh, West Side Story. Sorry. Didn't know he was gay. It's gay. <laughs> 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 there you go. Well, that's my, that's me on musicals. Thanks for that, guys. Um, like I said, I it's just an art form I really enjoy. I really appreciate. I love the the passion that is expressed in musicals. I am totally envious of anybody who can dance and hold a tune at the same time. Um, and I I am just so can't tell you how much I am so looking forward. To West Side Story, it better live. Up, it better live up to my expectation. I, I tell you that now. I'll be devastated if it doesn't, but I'm sure it will. So that's me. Awesome. This, I mean, musicals are unique. They're, they're there's nothing even close to being like them. Like that, you could look and be like, "Oh, that's similar to a musical." No, it's either a musical or it's not. It's just all dialogue. Mm, true. What's uh, what's what's the next episode? We're going to talk about shared universes. Oh, God. Explain. Which ones? <laughs> All of them. Are we going to talk about the, the Universal Studios Dark Universe reboot? And how it's failing? <laughs> we <laughs> absolutely are. <laughs> Get oh your ass God. kicked by Wonder Woman. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. we're going to talk about all of it. Uh, DC, Marvel, um, Dark Universe, um, Television shows. Happy Days is an extended universe. Sure. Um, it actually novels. is. The, the, uh, the Stephen King novels will take place in a shared multiverse. Um, the Brandon Sanderson novels that he writes take place in what's called the Cosmere. Um, yeah, so we will discuss the appeal and shared universes and also why I love them almost as much as I want them all to die in a fire. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. It does. Bye, guys. So, yeah. Bye-bye. Westfall story, Murlocs and Defias. <clears throat> <laughs> no one's going to get that. No, no, no. I am not throwing away my shot. I am not throwing away my shot. And you know, I'm just like my country. I'm young, scrappy, and hungry, and I'm not throwing away my shot. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode <coughs> of In oh, One's boy. Can. You're right there, James. <laughs> Yeah, what? I was just doing the introduction. Okay. Welcome to episode <coughs> of In One Skin. Oh, I see. Uh, 210, mate. 210. <laughs> you, want, you want to do it? Start all over again. It's 210. All you have to do is ask, mate. <laughs> I have had no sleep.